Abby, the streaming is good. We're good. All right. Uh, Abby, I assume the, the we're good with streaming, right? We can start? Yes. OK. All right, well, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you join us for this virtual Howard County delegation hearing. Um, and uh, we have a few speakers signed up um, and we'll go through the ground rules um, of um, the hearing in a moment. But I know um, we have, I think, uh, almost all the delegation members on this um, virtual hearing. So why don't we just start with some very brief introductions to the delegation members for them to del introduce what district they represent and what standing committee they serve on in, in the House of the Senate. So I'm Clarence Lamb, I'm the Senate Chair of the Howard County Delegation, um, represent District 12 in the General Assembly and serve on the Senate uh, Finance Committee. Um, and I'll pass along to uh, my co-chair, uh, Delegate Watson. Thank you um, and welcome everyone. Um, Senator Lamb, would you like me to talk about the, the rules? Sure. I think we're going to do introductions first, and then and then the rules. All right. So Sorry, maybe the, I missed the, that part. <laughs> sure. The delegates you, you, and senators in District Nine. Go ahead. Yes, you can <laughs> we'll do the rules, you. Senator. You can do the rules. But my name is Delegate Courtney Watson, and I represent Nine A, which is all I can And you City. serve on the House Appropriations Committee. And I serve on the House Appropriations Committee, and it's been a long day, but we're so happy to be here with all of you. Sounds great. How about the other uh, delegates and senators from Nine? Um, I'm Natalie Ziegler. I represent uh, District 9A and I serve on the Environment and Transportation Committee. I'm Delegate Chao. I'm representing District 9A. I'm in the Ways and Means Committee and uh, I'm in the Local Revenue and Education Subcommittee. We are representing part of Western Howard County and Western Montgomery County. Great. And Senator Hester? I am uh, Senator Katie Hester representing District 9, which stretches all the way from Ellicott City to uh, Damascus. And I serve on the new Triple E Committee, Education, Energy, and Environment. Great. Uh, we'll go in numerical order. We'll go to District 12 next. 12A. Okay. Hi, I'm Terry Hill. I represent uh, District 12A, which is uh, Howard County and serve on the Health and Government Operations Committee. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Delegate Jessica Feldmark, representing District 12A, um, parts of Columbia, Ellicott City, and Elkridge. Uh, I serve on the Ways and Means Committee, where I chair the Local Revenues Subcommittee. Great, and we'll go to District 13. Hi, good evening. I'm Delegate Vanessa Atterbury, representing District 13, and I chair the Ways and Means Committee in the House of Delegates. Hi, I'm Pam Gazzoni. Um, I represent District 13 also, and I'm on the Health and Government Operations Committee. Hi, I'm Delegate Jen Tarasa. I also represent District 13, and I'm on Environment and Transportation. Okay. Um, and I think Senator Gazzoni is planning to join us. He's running a little behind, so he should be with us shortly from District 13. Um, I'm going to go through just a, a, a quick rules of the hearing, and then um, we can go ahead and get started. So as a reminder, if you have not already figured out, this meeting is being recorded, and it's also being live streamed to the public via YouTube, so be cognizant of that. Um, we ask that all of the members, as well as the attendees, um, the witnesses, please keep your microphone muted until it's your turn to speak or if you've been recognized by the chairs. If you, as a witness, have signed up for more than one bill, you'll be allotted three minutes to speak. If you have two bills that you would like to speak about, um, you have four minutes. And if you have three or more bills that you would like to speak about, you have a total of five minutes. Um, we are keeping time, as you can see in the, um, there's a timer in the top left um, box um, that will count down. An alarm will ring when your time is up, and we will ask you to wrap up your testimony when the time um, is expired. Um, we are, um, you know, in, because we have a lot of bills, obviously, um, we do ask you to please respect the time limits so that we can ensure that we can accommodate as many uh, individuals in the public as possible in a reasonable amount of time tonight. Um, and we will try to announce um, the next three people that are coming up to testify next so that you can be prepared and know that um, you'll be 
on deck to be able to provide your verbal testimony. We do ask that you only unmute your mic when it's your turn to testify in order to minimize um, background noise. We're gonna go through the legislative bond initiatives first, followed by local bills that were not heard in November. So as you recall, we had a local delegation hearing in person at the George Howard building in November. All bills that were introduced, local bills that were introduced before that um, period, um, that was the hearing on the local bills. Um, this uh, hearing tonight is an opportunity for members of the public to be able to testify on bills that um, are statewide bills, not necessarily local bills, and on local bills that um, were introduced after the November local public hearing date. Um, we, um, uh, I think that's covered everything that we wanted to as part of the um, introduction of the hearing. Uh, Delta Watson, anything else that you would like to cover or um, oh, I mention think we before just, we begin? Just get started. Thank you. You're doing a great job. Great. Uh, do you want me to continue to call the witnesses? Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. All right. So sorry about the short notice, but we're going to start with um, Tim Stotzberger. Um, followed by Rob Powell, um, followed by Edie Harrison. And if any of the members of the delegation um, have questions, just raise your hand or virtual hand, um, and we will call you in the order that we, we see them. Obviously ask you to please be judicious in, in questions, um, just in the interest of time, but certainly any questions you wanna ask, you're welcome to do so. So we will start with um, Mr. Sotsberger. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. You have three minutes. Um, thank you, Chair Watson and Chairman Lamb. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Tim Schatzberger. I am a former board member of MAPA for nine years and treasurer. Um, I'm also the founder of Homeland Environmental and Homeland Labs. We specialize in septic or OSTS system inspections for real estate transfers. And we also have a wastewater lab uh, for analysis. We have 14 full time septic inspectors. Uh, I am in favor for the grant. Um, the need for training with OSDS systems goes far outside the classroom. Hands-on experience is required. Many of today's septic contractors are sons and daughters of previous generations. They were, they were able to learn uh, what others were not by simply observing their parents. That lack of experience is also a barrier to entry into the OSDS business for other entrepreneurs like myself. Um, I was able to get my experience through a larger company and later branch out on my own, but my path is rare in Maryland. The training center will not only allow for proper training of complex engineered systems to blue collar workers, but also facilitate entrepreneurialism in the OSDS industry and allow those already in the business to properly train new employees on these complex systems to grow their company. The end result will be a better designed system, better installed system, better maintained system that lasts longer, costs less, and introduce less waste to the environment. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Um, next, we will have Mr. Rob Powell also speaking about the training facility at the Central Maryland Research and Education Facility in Clarksville, followed by Edie, Eddie, sorry, Eddie Harrison, and then Kevin uh, Openik. Mr. Powell, you have three minutes. Mr. Powell did not get his invitation to the email. I just called the conference call with him. Oh, okay. Well, if he joins while we're still, um, you know, having this active hearing, he can certainly uh, chime in. Um, if he needs the link, you can certainly share that with him. Um, we'll go next to, and, and thank you for that, uh, Mr. Harrison. You're up next, followed by Mr. Kopenik, and then um, Sue Geckel. Okay, good evening, um, Chairman. Uh, Lamb, um, and members of the Howard County delegation. My name is Eddie Harrison. I'm the legislative liaison for the Maryland On-Site Wastewater Professional Association, or MALPA. Thank you for the opportunity to request funding for our project. I'm here looking for your financial support for MALPA to build our on-site wastewater training facility. MALPA's main objective has always been training of the on-site wastewater professionals. We have been doing so since, 19, since 2004. Many of these courses that we offer are for Maryland on-site wastewater professionals to receive MDE certifications required by regulation. We also offer a soil evaluation course geared for health department employees to better evaluate soils during perk tests. 
Our annual conference is attended by 80 to 90 attendees with on-site wastewater professionals, including installers, pumpers, property transfer inspectors, designers, including professional engineers, state and local code officials, and any other interested parties. The pres presentations at our conference are always on subjects to advance the industry and share the knowledge between the on-site wastewater professionals. Last year, HB 318 was passed out of legislature and was signed by the governor. 318 establishes statewide licenses for all on-site wastewater professionals with the requirement for training and CEUs. This will create a greater demand for MALPA to create and organize more training classes and more targeted subjects on the on-site wastewater industry. MALPA signed an MAU with the University of Maryland last spring to use two acres of their Folly Quarter Road farm near Ellicott City. MALPA board members and other MALPA volunteers have done a lot of site prep work over the summer and into the fall. Receiving this financial support at this stage of our expansion would be, good, would, would be so important for us to meet the upcoming demand. We have corporate sponsors to donate specific equipment for our demonstrations, so, some of which are valued at $15,000 each. There are some other corporate sponsors pledging to donate some less expensive equipment and materials to build other demonstration exhibits. This money is requested in order for us to build a classroom with bathrooms and storage. It will also pay for utilities and infrastructure for the site. We have big plans to construct many exhibits demonstrating the different technologies utilized in the on-site wastewater industry. We also plan to host homeowner education demonstrations to help the general public know what is buried in their backyard and how to properly maintain it. We plan to host field trips from high schools to showcase the many different professions that are available in the on-site wastewater industry. And the university is more than welcome to use this facility for any course of study they see fit. This facility is a great vehicle for the workforce development. It is also a great example of private-public part partnership. Our organization is act has active volunteers made up of blue-collar on-site professionals, white-collar professionals, public employees, and corporate sponsors. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Harrison. Um, next, uh, seeing no questions, we have uh, Mr. Kopenick, followed by Stu Geckel, and then Frank Hecker. Uh, Chair Watson and Chair Chairman Lamb, thank you for the opportunity to offer testimony regarding the training facility at the Maryland Central Maryland Research and Education Center. Uh, my name is Kevin Kepnick. I work for the Baltimore County Department of Environmental Protection and Sustainability, where I have served as the uh, manager for the well and septic program for the past 26 years. Uh, I'm the founding board member of the Maryland Onsite Wastewater Professionals and served on the board for nine years, helping to develop training. Uh, host technical conferences and establish partnerships um, between the industry professionals and the regulating community. Um, I initially agreed to get involved with MALPA back in 2007 because I saw a true need to improve the technical training and the standards for those working in the on, for on-site sewage disposal systems. Uh, with the advent of BAT systems and increased use of non-conventional technologies being installed throughout Maryland, uh, we need the regulators and the private industry to be properly trained and on the same page. Uh, if we're going to help reduce nitrogen loading to our waterways, protect our drinking water supplies, and public health, we need to be using all of the best technologies we have and a workforce that understands how to install, design, maintain, and properly uh, uh, keep septic systems functioning properly. Um, it has always been a goal of the MALPA board to have a training center in uh, that is inclusive of a demonstration site where regulators, designers, installers, and service providers can get real hands-on training um, about all the design principles, the technologies we employ uh, for on-site sewage disposal systems, uh, and the partnership that we um, have with University of Maryland and the option to use the Central uh, Maryland Research Education Center for MALPA training uh, provides a great opportunity for Maryland to become a leader in the on-site sewage disposal system uh, management and the funding uh, being considered here tonight what could help make this goal a reality. So I would hope that you vote in favor of this proposed bill. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, seeing no questions from the delegation members, we'll proceed to the next bill. Uh, these are now we're going to begin on on local bills and also statewide bills um, that wraps up the LBI, the so local bond initiative. 
Um, we'll start with uh, Stu Geckel. Uh, you have three minutes. You're here on Howard County Bill 14-23. Hi, good evening, Senator Lamb, uh, Delegate Watson, and all of the Howard County delegation. My name is Sue Geckel, and I live in Sykesville, Maryland. I am the chair of the Citizens Election Fund Commission in Howard County, but I'm speaking tonight as an individual since the commission did not have a chance to discuss the proposed legislation. I want to thank you for allowing me to testify tonight in support of Howard County Bill 14-23. I am a strong proponent of public financing of elections. By not allowing candidates to take money from political parties, special interest groups, PACs, or accept large dollar donations from individuals, I believe that public financing encourages more first time candidates to run, may lessen the partisan um, races that have occurred in Howard County recently. And I also think it encourages candidates to engage more with the voter um, who can't donate large amounts of money. I am testifying in favor of this bill because it's a first step to allow for public financing for school board candidates. It enables Howard County to make the choice to determine if public financing should be extended to the Board of Education candidates. And if approved, would enable the County Council to set parameters for use of the Citizens Election Fund by qualified school board candidates. Without this first step, we as a county would not be able to make this choice. The way the legislation is proposed, none of the winning candidates in 2024 or 2026 would have their term shortened, but it still allows for staggering the number of positions up for um, each election. Combined with separating the um, at-large candidates, which are the more expensive races, I think that will even out the financial burden for the county and enable the county to better fund the program. I strongly encourage you to support this legislation. And if it passes, I look forward to working on adding school board candidates to the Howard County Citizens Election Fund Program. Um, I also would like to say that I do express my support for Howard County Bill um, 1623 to allow for ranked choice voting for Board of Education candidates. I know that it's um, a, a little bit complicated, but I think that the citizens of Howard County um, would benefit. Um, and I think the school board is a good place for that to start. And I thank you for allowing me to express my views on both of those bills. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Gackle. Seeing no questions uh, from the delegation, we appreciate your input. Um, next, we'll have um, Frank Hecker, followed by Mary Kay Stigety, followed by Jim Thomas. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Hecker. You have three minutes. You're here on um, Howard County 16-23. Right. Thank you, Senator Lamb. Um, my name is Frank Hecker. I'm a resident of Elkett City and parent of a former student in the Howard County Public School System. Uh, thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify in support of Howard County Bill 16-23. Um, this proposed legislation does not mandate that Howard County select its Board of Education using ranked choice voting. Instead, it provides the county the flexibility to use ranked choice voting in Board of Education elections and also puts reasonable conditions on how the county can exercise that flexibility. Uh, I believe the state of Maryland should provide Howard County this flexibility. Uh, ranked choice voting allows voters to more effectively register their preferences among candidates and empowers candidates who have broad appeal to voters as opposed to relying on a narrow base. I think this is especially important in nonpartisan elections like those for the Board of Education. Their voters are not simply choosing between two political parties. Instead, they're selecting a Board of Education member um, that represents them in a nonpartisan way, and they should be offered a wider choice of candidates not only in the primary, but also in the general election, and should be able to indicate exactly which candidates they prefer from most preferred to least preferred. Ranked choice voting makes this possible. There are other advantages to ranked choice voting. For example, minimizing the possibility that voters will waste their votes voting for a preferred candidate who has less chance of winning. There are also other factors that need to be taken into account when implementing ranked choice voting and various objections that might be raised against it. 
I've addressed many of those in a blog post of mine that's been linked to by Delegate Wu. Uh, but these are all matters that can be considered in due time. Again, this legislation is not about imposing ranked choice voting on Howard County. It's Rather, it's about giving the county more freedom to decide for itself how to run these local nonpartisan elections. In particular, it's about empowering the county to consider adopting an election scheme, namely ranked choice voting, that empowers voters to more effectively express their preferences, empowers candidates who have a broader appeal to voters, and has been successfully used in a growing number of jurisdictions across the US. So I encourage members of the Howard County delegation and, and members of the Maryland General Assembly to give Howard County that choice. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Chair Watson. Thank you, uh, Chair Lamb. We are gonna move on to Howard County 17. First, I'd like to ask uh, Delegate Feldmark to give a brief description of this bill as she has requested that she do that since the version online isn't the same as what I think is being discussed. So go ahead, Delegate Feldmark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so uh, Howard County 1723 is a bill to expand voting rights in um, Columbia Village elections and uh, wanted to clarify, um, as you know, uh, some villages already have uh, one person, one vote. Many villages, like my own home village of Wild Lake, were limited to one vote per house. Um, so this bill would expand voting rights so that each property owner, each individual uh, listed on the deed would have a vote. And um, in the case of tenants voting, each individual on the lease would have a vote. Um, there was some concern uh, about this potentially increasing voting rights for commercial property holders as well. Um, this is uh, limited just to residential. Um, so it's it's just about expanding residents' voting rights. And um, we also added some clarifying language that this is setting a, a minimum in terms of voting rights, but villages that may have already expanded voting rights more broadly would not be impacted. Um, so the original draft posted online um, was was to get something online, even though we didn't have the, the final bill through uh, the review process and Department of Legislative Services yet. Um, and these are a couple of tweaks that were made um, through that review process. So just wanted to make sure that folks know this is expanding voting rights for residents and does not in any way limit village voting rights. It sets a, a minimum. So with that, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Delegate uh, Feldmark. And next up, we have our former council member, Mary Kay Sigety, in a special appearance by Inky the Cat. Good evening, everyone. Delegate Watson, thank you for recognizing Inky. When I sit here at this location, there's something about the Zoom meetings that she finds really appealing. Um, good evening, everybody. And thank you for um, this opportunity. Um, I am particularly heartened in, in this bill by recognizing that Senator Lamb, as well as uh, uh, Delegate Feldmark, um, as well as Delegate Terrassa, at least have been village board members in the past, as have I. And I think that um, that particular perspective will be important in, this, um, in looking at this bill. Um, I think that uh, Delegate Terrassa's village has one person, one vote, so you're very fortunate. Um, Senator Lamb's village and mine, uh, Wild Lake, are limited. So I'm here tonight in support of um, House of, uh, Howard County Bill 1723, and I really do want to thank Delegate Feldmark for listening to the grumblings of her disadvantaged village voters in our community. For your information, the founding documents of Wild Lake, our covenants, which were the first ones filed, says that all property owners are members. So um, from 1974 to 2022, both my husband and I were members of the association because both of our names were on our deeds. 
You'd think that our ownership of the unit would give each of us the right to vote in a village election, but you would be wrong. Because following along from that statement of we all have the right to vote, um, it says all members will be entitled to vote on each matter subject to the following exceptions. The first exception is that anybody who owns more than one property gets more than one vote. The second exception is all mem is when any such unit or lease is owned or held by more than one member, such members shall collectively be only entitled to one vote. And if such members cannot jointly agree as to how the vote would be cast, no vote shall be allowed. I find it absolutely astounding. Well, in today's world, I find it astounding. In the 1968 world, I'm not sure I find it astounding, but we have, we literally have voter suppression written right into our founding documents. This bill um, eliminates some of the voter suppression. And I think, as you all know, voter engagement is essential. If you've been following what's going on in Colombia right now, we know that voter suppression, or not voter suppression, but voter engagement is at an all, seemingly an all time low. And um, so I would ask you to please support this bill going forward. And thank you, my time's up. And you were right on the buzzer, which is a, a note of experience from your long tenure attending public hearings. Um, next up, we have another former council member, Ginny Thomas, and she is uh, talking about 1723. Yes, and I'm going to borrow Barry Kay's cat and somebody's dog. No, never mind. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I just got this bill. Our general counsel gave it to the, uh, the uh, CA uh, board on Friday. So I really was trying to find the bill. Now I'm not sure if what I got today is the final bill after listening to the delegate or not. So to be fair, I would like to just have a chance to actually read what is now before you. That would that would be helpful. Abby, may if that's the bill Abby sent me, then I have it uh, today. Um, but what my concerns and uh, some others, the major concern is why uh, the villages should they have a say in what's happening in, in their elections that they really control? It's not CA, it's, it's the villages. So I'm speaking as an individual um, tonight. I just have, I'm sharing concerns. I had to sign up yes or no, but I'm not supporting or opposing. I just wanna share with you some concerns. So why didn't we take, or did we take the time, and many of us are not aware of it, to contact the villages and just get their input based on how they would read the bill and how they actually operate so that they may have some constructive um, amendments or changes, because I don't think anybody, well, very few people should be opposed to one person, one vote. Second thing is the confusion about commercial when it said property. I don't think it's specified residential and uh, the concern one of the concerns is with an HOA actually and this would be a legal question for you can commercial property owners or retail really vote in an HOA usually it's a homeowners association um, so I guess that's the bottom line is do you is there any chance you could involve the people that are impacted by this in the villages that have to carry out the elections and make changes. I don't expect you to answer tonight, but before you vote on it, you know, give them a chance. Our board's raising concerns and they could be valid or they don't necessarily have to be valid, but it just seems the process is, needs, needs a little bit of help. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Thomas. And we are now moving on to Ruth White, who is testifying um, potentially on more than one bill. So we'll let her tell us what she is testifying on. And you're muted, Ms. White. Uh, hello, I'm here to recommend priorities from the Maryland Climate Partners. Um, which are continuing the work of the Climate Solutions Now Act 
uh, which is very ambitious, but will be in the process of implementation for years. And I'm a member of many um, groups that are part of the large coalition um, under www.MarylandClimateAction.com. Um, climate and community groups. And because my time is limited, I will email more information and fact sheets about these bills. Um, but the ones I want to highlight um, that are really necessary to reach the ambitious goals that uh, Climate Solutions set um, of having Maryland achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 20 45 and 60% greenhouse gas reductions by 2031 are um, the Empower the Energy Savings Bill, uh, SB 689, uh, the Community Solar Make Community Solar Permanent Bill, SB 613, Senator Brooks and in the House uh, Delegate Clippinger, um, and Offshore Wind. Um, I'm not sure whether that is uh, the bill um, that Senator Hester is co-sponsoring SB 071. The, the advocates call it, um, and we just got bill numbers, some of them today, um, promoting offshore wind energy resources act or the power act, um, which is crucial for our energy future. Um, uh, also the overall goal of electrification um, um, the climate partners feel is important, although uh, the Climate Solutions Act punted that to a, a study due in up for statewide uh, implementation, a study due in December 2023. I wanted to point out that Montgomery County has already passed a new building electrification bill, and Howard County is considering one which gained six strengthening amendments last night, and we hope is poised to pass for passage on Mark's. March 6th. And I also wanted to mention a small bill, but not one on the climate partners radar that um, uh, is uh, SB 447, the anaerobic digester work group sponsored by <clears throat> Senators Carosa and co-sponsored by Senator Hester and Senator uh, Gallen. Um, I question the need for this work group since Maryland has already funded two major studies this bill uh, would create an unbalanced industry focused uh, work group um, and should include environmental advocates, scientists and community members. Uh, Delaware on the Eastern shore has large polluting anaerobic digesters and the companies are poised for major expansion in Maryland. And as an advocate of uh, building electrification, I'm horrified how nationwide and here in this state, um, methane gas pipeline utilities are using the existence of biogas that they want uh, state subsidies for um, to produce uh, methane gas and put it into pipelines and try to present the methane as renewable as an alternative to electrification. Um, uh, uh, it's still methane gas and it doesn't belong as a fuel in our homes instead of beneficial electrification. Um, and um, I'm not sure, I don't see the time on the screen, um, but I will send information about all these bills uh, to uh, the delegation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. White. And next we have Evelyn Burton and she's gonna speak about Senate Bill 480, Mental Health Law Assisted Outpatient Treatment Programs and its companion bill. Thank Ms. You. Burton. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please okay. go ahead. Yes, um, in one year, 12 psychiatric hospitalizations, 18 emergency department visits, four crisis center visits, total charges $509,000. My relative, who I will call John, has a form of schizophrenia with diminished awareness of the need for treatment caused by the illness itself. He did not accept outpatient treatment, repeatedly becoming delusional with suicidal ideation. What the numbers do not tell you is the unimaginable suffering because Maryland does not have evidence-based assisted outpatient treatment called AOT. It is a tool for the court and provider to collaborate to provide outpatient treatment to people like John under a civil court order. 
John suffered terribly. He was terrified each time he saw a policeman in Columbia, Maryland, because he knew the officer was really a praying mantis which could devour him alive. Suicide thoughts tormented him. I suffered a gut-wrenching feeling when he would call with suicide thoughts and a plan. Paralyzing anxiety and sleepless nights when he was missing. Was he dead? Opponents of AOT say assertive community treatment act teams, peer support or guardianship works. John refused to talk to the Coward County Act Team. Neither living with a certified peer support specialist 24 seven nor obtaining guardianship at $23,000 helped with treatment acceptance. John became homeless, lost all his $70,000 saving. He almost got arrested and would have joined the 50% of inmates in the Howard County Jail with mental illness. Therefore, I sent him to Arizona. He was put in an AOT program and has been complying with medication, psychiatric appointments, and enrolled in vocational training. With treatment, John's ability to exercise his freedom of speech has been restored. In response to how are you, he no longer says, what's it like to be pink lemonade? You and Jill are pink lemonade. My heart aches when he begs to come back to Maryland where his friends and family live. However, until Marilyn has AOT, I will not risk him suffering again or brain damage from untreated psychosis or jail. 47 states allow AOT. Marylanders should not have to leave to get the life-saving treatment under AOT. How can we allow suffering with a depilidating illness when AOT can provide the on-ramp to treatment? Please show compassion to your constituents and pass AOT this year. Thank you. I'll answer any questions you like. Thank you, Mrs. Burton, for sharing your story with us. That's a very powerful testimony. We appreciate your being here tonight. We are uh, going to now call Charles Richardson. Uh, thank you, Delegate Watson, Senator Lamb. I'm Charles Richardson, MD. I'm speaking in favor of State Bill 480, which would authorize the establishment of assisted outpatient treatment programs. My own perspective comes from my 32 years of work as a psychiatrist at Spring Grove Hospital, where my patients have a double bur burden of a very difficult illness while being um, tied up in a very frustrating legal system. Over 60,000 Maryland residents suffer from the neurobiological illness we call schizophrenia. And many of these patients lack the capacity to perceive the presence of an illness or the need for treatment. This cognitive deficit is a symptom of their brain disorder, and it undermines their capacity to make informed treatment decisions. Assisted outpatient treatment aims to increase adherence to outpatient treatment for those who are unable to recognize their need for treatment and who have demonstrated adverse consequences as a result. The absence of AOT and a civil path to sustain treatment leaves these patients at the mercy of their illness and contributes to the fact that virtually 100% of state hospital patients are admitted with criminal charges. Several outcome studies have been conducted on AOT programs over the last 20 years, and these consistently show that patients assigned to AOT um, subsequently demonstrate reduced risk of suicide and violence, reduced inpatient admissions and better social functioning, Importantly, a 2011 study conducted by researchers at Columbia University School of Public Health found that the risk of any arrest was nearly three times higher and arrest for violent behavior was over eight times higher among outpatients prior to their assignment to AOT compared to their assignment to AOT period. Now, it's important to recognize that the liberty restrictions created by AOT are modest, going no farther than to increase the likelihood of civil commitment to a community hospital for patients who have a history of non-adherence, associated harm to self or others, while also meeting the clinical criteria for admission to a hospital. These have to be compared to the far more restrictive criminal court order treatment that's relied upon in Maryland today. Patients who are adjudicated not criminally responsible for even minor offenses can spend years in the hospital before being granted a conditional release, which then requires compliance with all medications, controls where they live, 
what their activities will be. It lasts for five years and is often renewed without a hearing. Failure to comply leads to court-ordered readmission to a state facility regardless of clinical need. All too often, the release is revoked and the patients must start over from square one. One can view AOT as a means to protect the public from untreated patients, but my experience, I see it patients from arrest. The trauma and punishment psychotic patients suffer as a result of an arrest and its extreme consequences are arguably cruel. Essentially, patients are punished for their illness for far longer than you or I would be for the same charge. AOT would provide a less restrictive alternative to achieve successful outpatient treatment with far fewer restrictions in the patient's daily life. And I respectfully request that you support Senate Bill 480. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Up next, we have Nicole Deverack, and she's testifying on House Bill 65. Hey, thank you. Good evening, Chairpersons Lamb and Watson and members of the delegation. It's very nice to see you all. Many of you know me already. My name is Nicole Dvorak. I live in Howard County in Ellicott City. I'm speaking tonight in support of House Bill 65, the Bill on Collective Bargaining and Public Library Systems. I want to thank Senator Guzzoni for co-sponsoring this legislation in the Senate and I agree with the Senator that it's very worthy of support. I work in the Baltimore County Public Library System, and I'm a proud member of the BCPL Employees Union, which won its union election in December of 2021, and represents over 400 employees. I was one of six employees on our first union contract negotiating committee, and that contract was ratified and fully funded last year. Many people are likely not aware that the majority of public library systems across the state do not have the legal right to unionize and that library staff are not county employees, so the county labor codes do not apply. Um, the four counties that are currently um, have the legal right to unionize are Baltimore County, Prince George's, Montgomery and Howard, plus Baltimore City, and they had to work through their respective local delegations to accomplish that. This means there are hundreds of library employees across the state that do not have the legal right to unionize from Anne Arundel, Charles, Carroll County, and so on. And these employees do an immense amount of work for very little pay. Many of them face regular financial insecurity, housing insecurity, all while assisting patrons who are facing the same circumstances. In 2013, the Howard County delegation, and I want to point out um, most of almost the entire Howard County delegation membership has changed since then, um, as you all are aware. Um, but at that time, legislation passed with the delegation that did give the legal right to unite to HCPL employees, but to date, those employees have not yet moved forward with unionization. A couple of key things that this bill would accomplish are as follows. The first one is that for those jurisdictions in Maryland whose public library employees do not have the legal right to unionize at this time, it would give them that right. Um, it would also provide a consistent process for those workers to follow if they were to choose to unionize. Since this is giving them that choice, this is not a requirement to unionize in this particular legislation. Um, as you are aware, there are thousands of employees across the state who already have uh, this right in different sectors. Um, the second main thing that this legislation would accomplish is that it would bring Howard County's law in line with other counties. Howard County's law, when it was passed in 2013, included some language that arguably deters employees from actually pursuing unionizing, um, so even though they, they currently have that right. Um, this bill would update that language. Um, I would also like to express my sincere support for House Bill 116, as well as House Bill 275, which are collective bargaining bills as well. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will move on to Eric Smith, who's also testifying on uh, assisted outpatient treatment programs, HB or S Senate Bill 480. Eric Smith. Hello, Maryland leaders. My name is Eric Smith and assisted outpatient treatment AOT saved my life. Before AOT, I had a terrible quality of life. Shortly before entering into AOT, I wouldn't eat anything other than butter because voices in my head told me everything else was poison. I also thought I was an asset working with the FBI. And since the reality I was living in was no reality at all, I was arrested not long after that because I was trespassing, going places the voices in my head told me to go. 
At that time, I did not voluntarily seek out nor remain engaged in any type of treatment for severe mental illness because of anosognosia. Anosognosia, a brain-based impairment that is common for people like me, stole my ability to understand I was ill and prevented me from making rational choices. No matter what anyone told me, I believed I was a code breaker for the US government. I do not want to be psychotic, but when I was psychotic, that isn't something I could understand due to anosognosia. When I was psychotic, I told numerous treatment providers and my family to leave me alone and that I didn't want treatment. The AOT team understood my voiced opposition to treatment was not the real me talking. It was me being held hostage by my own mind, not a personal choice. My life was saved by an AOT judge and treatment team that recognized I needed rescuing from my illness. And the only way that was going to happen based on my history was by involuntarily stabilizing me as an inpatient and then immediately stepping me down into AOT as soon as I no longer met criteria to remain a psych inpatient. Without AOT, I would have continued on my path of not seeking out or trusting treatment providers. Without the judge and AOT as step down care from my psychiatric hospitalization, I would have stopped taking the medication I need to no longer be a danger to myself. After more than 10 years of counseling, psychiatry, and voluntary treatment failing me, I lost faith in treatment providers. Since the AOT program I was in relied on a judge playing an active role in communication, I was able to place trust back into treatment providers because the judge's authority resonated with me in a way that no treatment provider could or did up to that point. I support disability rights and civil rights groups. That said, some people from these groups oppose AOT and they are good people operating on misconceptions or misplaced fear. The truth is simple. Anosognosia and my illness robbed me of the ability to be free and live life for many years. AOT restored my ability to be free and live life and it can do so for others. Despite being a high school dropout with severe mental illness, thanks to AOT, I graduated magna cum laude with a BA in psychology and then earned a master's degree with a 4.0 GPA. Please support AOT as a recognition that a population of people exists, including me, who need AOT and are failed in the absence of it, and have faith in the wonderful treatment providers and judges of Maryland to make AOT work for people like me who need it. 47 of our 50 states in the U.S. have created AOT laws, and it is time for Maryland to join them. I look forward to answering any questions you may have, and I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Very compelling testimony. We appreciate you sharing your personal story. And we will move on now on the same bill to Janet Edelman. Good evening. My name's Janet Edelman. I live in Columbia and have been a mental health advocate for over 40 years. I'm currently vice chair of the Howard County Behavioral Health Advisory Board, but I'm testifying today as an individual. Please support SB 480 and its companion house bill to authorize the establishment of an evidence-based assisted outpatient treatment program in Maryland. Um, AOT is the practice of delivering outpatient treatment under a civil court order to a small high risk subset of individuals with severe mental illness. The court and the mental health system work collaboratively to assist individuals to engage in treatment. The order requires an individualized treatment plan designed with input from the AOT participant and is monitored by the local mental health system. The bill will be assigned to the Senate Finance and the House HGO committees. Unless AOT legislation passes this year, Maryland will not be eligible for this year's SAMHSA grant to start a new AOT program. These grants are generally only given out every four years. I will be addressing some of the objections to AOT please refer to my written testimony for more complete explanation. Opponents claim that scarce mental health services should go to those who voluntarily agree to them. But standard medical triage practice requires that those most at risk of severe outcomes be given priority. Also, if you do not understand that you are sick, you're not going to volunteer for treatment. Research shows that AOT programs result in very significant cost savings even in the first year, which can be applied to expanding services for all. Opponents say that AOT is not needed because the Baltimore Outpatient Civil Commitment pilot addresses the same need and could be expanded statewide. But the OCC pilot is not serving the sickest individuals since they will not join the program voluntarily. Opponents claim AOT may be applied to many people inappropriately. In order to address that, this concern, 
the 2023 Maryland legislation has more specific criteria than the 2022 bill. A common claim by opponents is that AOT permits forced medication of outpatients. This is not true. In conclusion, the AOT program addresses an unmet need in Maryland. Maryland has not implemented an evidence-based practice. As a result, the sickest continue to require costly services in the hospitals, jails, prisons, and homeless shelters. Please pass SB 480. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Edelman. Next, we have Marianne, Marianne Eichenberger, followed by Melissa Mulrini. Ms. Eichenberger, are you with us? Excuse me, she didn't receive the link, so I think she just emailed to request the link. Hey, okay. um, while we're seeing if we can work that out, let's go on to Melissa Mulraney. There we go, thank you. Um, uh, I'm Melissa Mulraney, I'm uh, just a private citizen with some experience with family. So I'd like to address uh, support of SB 480. Uh, the availability of evidence-based assisted outpatient treatment could be a life-changing tool for our family and friends with serious mental illness. My personal experience involved a relative who was unaware of his illness due to anosognosia, a neurological cognitive deficit caused by mental illness, which prevents recognition of one's illness and the need for treatment. Therefore, he refused voluntary treatment. For 20 years, my relatives struggled to get and keep a job, but without medications and ongoing psychiatric assistance, he was unable to remain gainfully employed or independent, uh, living independently. Had evidence-based AOT been available in Maryland to provide treatment, he would not have suffered for so long and been unable to achieve his goals. After finally getting on medication and psychiatric care, he's gained the ability to understand his illness and his, the benefits of treatment. He's also been able to hold on to a job. Our family could have been spared over 20 years of grief and uncertainty as we struggled to protect him from himself and the ravages of untreated serious mental illness. Please support SB 480 and its companion bill to add evidence-based assisted outpatient treatment to the options available to the mental health professionals and give individuals with untreated SMI and their families hope for life as a healthier and contributing member of society. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Ms. Mel Rainey. And I believe I see Marianne Eichenberger. If yes, uh, Marianne is with us, you may yes. proceed with your testimony on SB 480. Thank you very much. Um, I am an advanced practice mental health nurse of 40 years, and I live in District 12 in Howard County. I'm speaking as an, as an individual. I support the bill for assisted um, outpatient treatment. I work with many seriously mentally ill clients that due to their illness, usually delusions and hallucinations, have refused treatment and ended up homeless or have been arrested for criminal behavior and hospitalized in a forensic mental health facility. It is a critical, it is really critical to get these individuals whose judgment, reasoning, and or inability to control their behaviors into treatment so that they can make informed decisions regarding their future treatment. The evidence shows that severely mentally ill clients that do not receive treatment in earlier stages of their illness or that have had multiple times to restabilize have a poor response um, to future treatment and poorer long-term outcomes. AOT Nationwide for the Mentally Ill um, has shown that it decreases the number of nights that they're in correctional facilities, the number of homeless nights that they um, are experiencing. I have worked with a client who due to her hallucination, delusions and hallucinations, she feel, felt that she was poisoned. She remained on the streets homeless, awake and fearful every night. Um, this client had been raped when she was in a shelter. Um, she was begging for food. She was admitted numerous times to short day, three to five day admissions, um, was discharged generally to a shelter. 
Um, of course, she didn't go there because that had been where the rape had occurred. Um, she finally ended up in the forensic system after she um, was caught burglarizing, trying to get food, um, and did end up getting treatment in the facility, which actually turned out to be the thing that turned things around for her. Um, I actually worked with her in the outpatient setting, and after eight years, she was able to get her own home. And um, she was able to get her first animal, which was a cat. And the expression on her face when she, she talked to me about that was absolutely something I, I think I will never forget. Um, I think one of the things that as someone who works with people who are mentally ill and, and who really don't understand that they have an illness, and I think you've seen a number of people tonight who have actually shown that this is a problem, um, that the AOT is something that would really prevent them from falling into some really horrendous situations. Um, and I think people forget that a lot of our clients are more often victims than they are perpetrators. And um, um, sorry. Um, and I think that's a really important. So please support SB 480. Um, and thanks for your time. Thank you for sharing that story. And the last person of the evening is Liz Fainer, and she's uh, testifying on multiple bills. Liz, are you with us? Yes, I just got the unmute. <laughs> Thank uh, you. You can proceed. Showed up. Uh, Okay, thank you. I'm Liz Fainer in District 13, and I'm testifying for several energy and climate bills. I request your support for SB 613, Make Community Solar Permanent in Maryland. The Community Solar Program has been in place since 2017 as a pilot, allowing any Maryland resident who pays an electric bill to take advantage of a local community solar project and save 5 to 25% off their bill every month. Whether a renter or a homeowner, all Marylanders benefit by reducing their utility costs while Maryland benefits from a greener grid. Our own household joined Community Solar in addition to our installed solar panels to have all of our electricity use, usage from clean renewable solar. This bill would make Community Solar a permanent program and add other improvements to the existing program. One important improvement requires all projects to reserve at least 40% of their created energy for low and moderate in income households. Another major improvement is, that is key to this legislation is the inclusion of utility consolidated billing, which allows one single utility bill. Consolidated billing is essential to make it easier for people who use energy assistance to participate in the community solar program. Right now, subscribers need a checking account or a credit card, and not everyone has those financial resources. Those that pay cash for the utility bills are basically locked out of the program, the ones that kind of need it the most. Uh, we currently have consolidated billing for third-party retail energy suppliers, so we should have it for community solar as well. Another bill I'm asking you to support is the Clean Energy Savings Act, SB 689, which builds on the successful EMPOWER program, which was created in 2008. EMPOWER has improved energy efficiency, which has saved utility customers money, reduced pollution, and helped protect the environment. However, this legislation is, is needed to improve the EMPOWER program to, ensure, to achieve greater energy savings and more public health and environmental benefits. Right now, Empower still provides incentives for fossil fuel appliances and home heating, which can lock in consumers for decades and doesn't provide any incentives to switch to electric alternatives. This bill will stop incentives for fossil fuel appliances, maximize federal efficiency incentives, and create new incentives for electrification, efficient electric appliances, and home heating. In addition, Empower will be updated to include greenhouse goals, greenhouse gas reduction goals, and help expand access for low-income households to state and federal funds. These are just a few of the many improvements that are needed to empower Marylanders. In order to meet our climate goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, 
in Maryland, we need to have a truly renewable portfolio standard, the RPS. Maryland's current RPS considers burning trash, burning chicken manure, burning wood, and producing methane all as renewable energy. Maryland tax rate Maryland ratepayers contributed over 32 million to subsidize these dirty energy sources in 2019 alone, and over 200 million since 2008 through renewable energy credits. These dirty energy sources are overwhelmingly located outside of Maryland, meaning that Maryland ratepayers' money is flowing out of state. 108 million to dirty energy sources since 2008 in Virginia alone. Maryland cannot afford another year of throwing our renewable energy money away on polluters. So please support the Reclaim Renewable Energy Act. It's SB 590 and HB 718. And then I'd like to speak about the serious concerns I and several advocacy groups have about SB 447 anaerobic digestion work group. We have extreme concerns about the makeup of the work group. There are no environmental, environmental groups, no health science or in environmental justice groups are included at all, mainly industry proponents. Um, and one of the groups that was listed wasn't even consulted about the work group. This proposed work group is definitely not balanced and the voices of local communities with environmental justice concerns are not being represented. And we question why this work group is being formed since the state has already spent money on two studies that were already um, uh, completed. So thank you so much for letting me speak tonight. Thank you, we appreciate your testimony. And that uh, concludes the testimony for tonight, members, I would remind you that we need to be back on Zoom in less than 12 hours. So we will see you tomorrow morning at 8.30 for our um, delegation meeting. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all then. And to the public who's with us, thank you so much for testifying and be part, part of the, our public process here in Annapolis. We appreciate your engagement. Good night, everybody.